Welcome to this Bible Gateway Conversation. I'm Jonathan Peterson. As someone who already uses Bible Gateway, you know we're always trying to think of more ways you can read and understand the Bible. We want to challenge everyone to study the Bible more deeply, and you're the man who can help users meet that challenge. So let's begin by having you describe in the way you would for your Greek students mm -hmm. why knowing even a little biblical Greek mm -hmm. can open a new world of understanding when studying the Bible. Yeah, I always want to emphasize that translations are good. Uh, you, you don't ever want to convey, convey the idea, well, if you don't know Greek, you can't really learn your Bible. And translations are good. I've spent a large chunk of my life doing them. So I, I want to say it up front, especially reading multiple translations is really good. But they are limited because it is one step removed from what God's word is. And all you have to do is compare verses in different translations and you can see it. So for example, John 3, 16, for God so loved the world, one translation. You go to another translation, it says, for this is how God loved the world, colon, he gave. And you go, well, that's different. And so these are the kind of things that translators wrestle with that then they have to make a decision but it just shows you that knowing a little Greek can uh, really help. Uh, the Bible's written in three languages, most of the Old Testament's in Hebrew, a little bit's in Aramaic, the New Testament's in Greek, and they're just different languages. They have different vocabulary, they have different grammar, uh, they're expressions out of different cultures, and all of those things make it uh, a little different. And so what I, what I found is that even if you can learn a little Greek, and if you know kind of what the limits are, uh, you can really go a lot deeper in Bible study. Hmm. Run through the biblical Greek alphabet. Uh, describe how to pronounce Greek <laughs> and explain what transliteration is. Before I answer the question, I, and the academic side of me needs to say that there is debate on how we pronounce some of these letters, especially the vowels. Uh, for me, I pronounce the O class as, as a short O, A. Uh, other people say it's a long O sound. So there is some debate, especially if you kind of listen to how I say it, which is the standard Erasmian pronunciation versus someone like who speaks modern Greek. So there are some differences, but uh, the, and the, neat, the neat thing is Greek doesn't follow off the English. English follows Greek in, in a sense, but it, they kind of match up for a while and then kind of go off and they match up again. So I'm just gonna run through it real quickly, but you'll hear the similarities. So it starts uh, 24 letters, seven vowels. So Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon is like A, B, G, D, E. There's no C sound uh, in Greek. So Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Delta, Epsilon. And then Zeta, Eta, Theta. Now they hook up again. Iota, Kappa, Lambda, Mu, Nu, C. They have a couple of these double sounds in there. C. -C. <laughs> and then Omicron, the short O. Omicron, P, Rho, Sigma, Tau, Upsilon and then phi, he, psi, omega. <laughs> so uh, it's fun to learn the alphabet. Students, they, they may look at that and first go, oh, I can't learn that, it's all different. But I found that students really enjoy it. In fact, I had my kids when they were about three and five say the alphabet, and a lot of people still write in because they, they, they're so little, but they say them so clearly that, well, if, my, if these three and five-year-old kids can say it, I, I can say it as well. <laughs> Transliteration is what a lot of Bibles do because, or a lot of books do because they, uh, people get a little scared of the Greek alphabet, which they shouldn't, but they do. And transliteration is just letter for letter substitution. So for an alpha, in, uh, transliterated would be an A, beta would a, be, be a B, you know, epsilon would be an E, so they, they kind of line them up. So one of the things we do in, in class is we start spelling silly words. So I say spell cat in Greek. Well, it's kappa, alpha, tau, cat. <laughs> but again, you emphasize that kappa, alpha, tau does not mean feline. That's just a transliteration of the letters. Uh, it's actually a preposition mm -hmm. in, in Greek, but uh -huh. that's what a transliteration is. Uh. Uh, you mentioned uh, modern Greek there. Mm -hmm. uh, what's the difference between biblical Greek and modern Greek? I'm told that in um, Greece today, they're actually teaching not Koine or biblical Greek, but they teach uh, ancient Greek, as a, but it's a foreign language almost. Wow. 
So there's been quite a bit of change in the language. Now, the basic structure of the language is the same. The, the basic alphabet is the same. So it's not like you're learning a totally different language, but all languages evolve. I mean, if you go back and try to read Chaucer, mm. uh, it's taught in schools as a foreign language because both Old and Middle English, just you look at them and you, there's no way to know what they mean. Mm. So languages evolve and Greek has certainly evolved. Well, please explain what word studies are and why they're important. Yeah. At one level, explaining a word study is really simple. It's, well, what does the word mean? But the problem is that words don't have a meaning. Uh, words have a range of meaning. It's called a semantic range. And any word, like take the word run. What does run mean? Well, you can run a business or have a runny nose. I mean, you know, you, the words have this wide range of meaning. I like to think of words as being, a, the meaning is a bundle of sticks. And each of the sticks in the bundle is one of the things that that word means. So run may mean to run fast or to run somewhere or to run a business or run out of time. Each of those are sticks in the bundle. And so the challenge of a word study is to figure out what does the word mean in its totality? And then what you do is you figure out, well, what does this word mean in this specific context? So, yeah, word studies are simply, what does the word mean? Uh, but the process of doing it is, is a little more complicated. You know, we like words. We hang on to words. We, uh, I've heard sermons preached or points in a sermon uh, being based on what a word means or we'll be reading along in the Bible and we'll see a word and it'll really speak to us because of the work of the Spirit in our life or something that happened to us that morning and, and we zero in on that word. So words are really, really important, but they don't just mean one thing. And that, again, that, that's the challenge. When I'm speaking, especially to college audiences, and I try to illustrate that meaning is conveyed by words and grammar and context in the passage, cultural context. I'll say things like, uh, what do you think of when I say the word plethora? And I can always tell who's seen Three Amigos. Because when I say a plethora, and I'll say it kind of like that, some will laugh and some will kind of look at me. I say, no, a plethora of pinatas. <laughs> and, and they still don't get it. I said, see, you don't have the cultural context to understand what I really mean with the word plethora. But if I say inconceivable, they all know because they've seen The Princess Bride. Hmm. I once did a wedding for a relative and they, they asked me to start this way. And I started by saying, marriage. <laughs> and half the people hit the floor laughing and the other half are going, what is he talking about? <laughs> well, I was referencing something in our cultural context. Hmm. So words are important because of the building block of communication, but it's the word plus the grammar plus the context, in our case of the Bible, plus the cultural context, whether you know Princess Bride or not, that all goes into shaping how we understand these words. Mm. So when it gets then to Greek word studies, it's, it's actually a whole different level because a, a Greek word can have multiple meanings and we can have one word in English that's a translation of multiple Greek words. And so the problem in doing English word studies in the Bible is that you may not be studying the right Greek word. Mm. So you may go, for God so loved the world. Well, what does love mean? Let's just use that as an example. Well, it really depends upon what Greek word is being translated by love because there's three or four different Greek words for love and there's different nuances of meaning attached to each one of those. Mm. So what you really have to do is look at the verse and you find out what's the Greek word behind it, and that's what you study. And that's what we're gonna be talking about today is, is how do you actually do that. Right, right. And having accomplished that, then what are the benefits to the person doing it? Uh, the, the benefits are you actually are studying God's word. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I can say translations are good, but you're, you're looking at an English word that is at best an approximation of the Greek word. There, there's, as far as I know, there's no exact equivalence between an English word and a Greek word. Uh, take the word the in English. You think, okay, there's gotta be an article in Greek and it means the. Well, there is a word ha that is often translated as the. It's also translated as he. 
I wow. mean, it, the, the Greek word ha can function as the article. It can also function as possessive. It can also function as a grammatical marker. It has no meaning, lexically anyway. And so the problem is we'd love to do these word studies. We want to know what the Word of God means, and we want to know what each of the words of the Word of God means. But if all you're doing is studying English, you don't know whether you're actually studying the right word because uh, languages aren't codes. There's not an exact equivalence. But let me put it this way. When I first started learning Greek, I thought that basically languages were codes. So in Morse code, my name is Bill, and my name in Morse code is dot did 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 da did did da did Okay. Um, and I just assumed that beta, iota, lambda, lambda would have a different set of codes. Well, it doesn't at all. That's not how languages function. So because they're not exact equivalences, we need tools to help us get from the English word we're looking at to what the specific Greek word is underneath it. Hmm. Another good example is when we come across the, the word group of slave or servant. Well, you, you look at it and you go, well, are we a slave of Christ or are we a servant of Christ? And well, as you dig down into the Greek, you realize that doulos can mean both. And so the translators have had to make a choice as to which way they're going to translate doulos. But when you're looking at the word servant, you want to know if it's doulos or if it's some other Greek word. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's why you, you really want to dig down. So it really does help in word studies. Another advantage of being able to just do Greek word studies, and let me say, doing Greek word studies is really easy. Uh, the, it, it may sound a little daunting at first, but the, the tools are there that make it really pretty easy to do it. And if you just understand just a couple of basic things about language, like what I've been talking about, mm -hmm. the, uh, it's, you can do these things pretty quickly. You can see why translations are different, and that's a real big thing for me. You, know, you sit around in a Bible study, and you're reading Psalm 23, and one person's Bible says, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And another translator says, you know, even though I walk through the darkest valley, darkest valley, I will fear no evil. Well, what is it, death or a dark valley? Mm -hmm. Well, the fact of the matter is that the Hebrew word behind it doesn't mean death. The King James was being interpretive. It's saying death. It means a dark, lonely, um, dangerous kind of place. Hmm. And so as the translators are trying to translate that word, one comes up with death. The other one comes up with a, like a dark valley. So as you understand Greek and Hebrew words, you can start to see why translations are different. You can also read better commentaries, and that's a real big thing. I want people in the church to not be stuck with just really these real lay-oriented commentaries. I want them to be able to read some of the better commentaries, which assume that you at least understand what a word study is and, and how they function. And that's a really big deal. And also, along with that, is just being able to understand your Bible study software. I mean, you get the Bible app from Olive Tree and you do a mouse over if you have a Strong's Bible and it pops up all kinds of information down here in the lower left-hand corner. Or you go to Bible Gateway and you bring up the Mount in a linear and it's got a bunch of something underneath it. What is that? Well, those are transliterations of the Greek and you can do your word studies that way. So it, if you know just a little, it, commentaries and like translations are different and all that stuff, it, there's a lot of advantages. Mm -hmm.